this is the Fiddle Channel. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the tricky subject of chords and chord symbols. Violinists and fiddle players are at a distinct disadvantage uh, compared to a lot of other musicians in that uh, we can go for years and years and years playing merrily away at our melodies, never having the slightest idea what the chords are doing behind us. Um, and so you can find yourself 20 years into a career and not have the slightest idea of what A minor 7 means. Um, and up until that point you might never have needed to know. Uh, if, you're, if you've never improvised, then um, that certainly wouldn't be a problem. Um, it, it does become a problem either when you have to instruct the person that, you are, that is accompanying you, or you need to improvise, or possibly you might be writing tunes for yourself and you need to have some idea of what the chords are doing. So, um, I'm going to take you uh, from the very basics through uh, what chord names mean, what chords are, and how you get to the really complicated names and how you can begin to understand them. So let's start off with um, a C major scale. And we're going to give uh, a number to each of the notes. So um, C, first note naturally is going to be one. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And eight is an octave, eight is the same as one. So that's your C major scale. Now chords are made from notes of a scale and they're notes that harmonize and usually you get a harmony by taking alternate notes from a scale. So rather than putting a C and a D together, which doesn't harmonize well, we're going to put the first, the third and the fifth, or the one, the three and the five together. And that, uh, the three notes are called a triad and they can make up a chord. And in this case, um, the first, the third and the fifth of the scale of C gives you a C major triad. Why is it major and not minor? Um, because uh, there's your root, that's your third note. If the third note is two whole spaces or two tones above, then that makes it major. If it's one and a half tones, then that makes it minor. So that's the C minor. That's the C major. So the, the one, the three, and the five, or the root, the third, and the fifth, give you uh, the first chord of the C major scale. So carrying on up the scale, if we start not on the first note, but on the second note, and if we again take the um, alternate notes, so those three notes are still part of the C major scale, but we now have a D, an F, and an A. And you'll see that the distance between the first note and the second note is now a minor third. It is a tone and a half, or a whole and a half space. Then that makes this a D minor triad. So from the same scale, we start off with a C major and a D minor. So, I hope you're with me so far. Now, most chords actually don't have just three notes, they have four notes. So, the, uh, start going back to the C chord. That is taking the, the one, the three, the five, and the seven. So again, missing one out each time, or alternating notes. So that note is the seventh note. And that is called a major seven because it is um, above the fifth. It's two tones, two whole notes. Um, so that makes this a C major seven. And a C major seven can be written C major seven. It can be written um, C. Uh, with a triangle. It can be written C with a triangle 7, which is very confusing and it's unfortunate that um, no one actually got round to uh, sorting out chord names and chord symbols all over the world so everyone agreed what they should be. So um, C major 7 and uh, C triangle 7 and C triangle are all the same thing. Now to uh, a jazz musician, um, almost all major 
chords are actually played as C major 7s. So if it just says C, then a jazz musician will automatically assume that that's going to be a C major 7. Um, if you're not a jazz musician, that's not necessarily going to be the case, but don't worry about that too much. So what other kinds of C7 uh, chords are there? Because um, there are various 7th chords. So uh, you can also have a C minor 7. So that is a C minor. And then the minor 7 part is the um, tone and a half, or three half notes up to there. So that's C minor 7. And that will be written C small m7. Uh, it can also be written C dash 7, unfortunately. So C minor 7 has a minor third at the bottom there and a minor third at the top. Uh, we have another kind of 7 and that is just called a C7. Now what this means is um, that the this is a major chord. That's a C7. What, what it really is is a flattened seventh. So the seven note, which would have been that in a C major seven, is brought down, flattened. So, so if you just see C7, then that means um, you've got a major third at the bottom and a minor third at the top. So you can have C, which means C major, you can have C minor, you can have C major 7, you can have C minor 7, and you can have C7. Now we started off by looking at C, mi C major 7, followed by the second chord made from the C major scale, which was the D minor 7. Let's carry on up the scale. So, starting off C major 7, that's D minor 7, that's E minor 7, that's F major 7, that's G7, also called G dominant. Um, next one, that's A minor 7, and then we have a strange one. That is a B minor 7 flattened 5th. Now, why does it get that strange name? So, um, let's look at the first note, a B. Second note, that makes it a minor chord. Um, most chords have the 5th the uh, on the same place in the, on the next string, a 5th above, but this is flattened, so it's a B minor 7 flattened 5th. Um, and it's minor 7 because that would be minor 7, that's B flat minor 7. So all of these chords are made up from the notes of the C major scale. Uh, these are the natural chords that, are, that will occur in C major. Um, and uh, a tune that's made up of just these chords is what I call a diatonic sequence and what that means basically is for improvising um, if you just have these chords then it's very easy to improvise because all of your notes are going to belong to the C major scale. Just going back to the B flat, just going back to the B minor 7 flat and 5th that is also sometimes called B half diminished. Um, and we'll come to diminished in a minute, but um, again, it, this is two, two different names for the same chord. And a B half diminished can be written B, a circle with a diagonal line through it, uh, and then a 7. So, um, that chord is often paired with another strange one called E7 flat 9. Um, now, an E7 would be starting on an E, major 3rd. Flat and seven. Now the flat nine is going to be uh, that's the eight. So a flat nine has an F. So that flat nine is written in brackets 
and that's an added note so this is a five note chord um, now when you see a chord like this if you are not uh, familiar with jazz chords then you may find this very confusing and frightening um, but in fact uh, stuff like a, a flat nine an added note on the end of a chord is not really as important as it may look um, one reason being that an accompanist is quite likely to change the fine detail of a chord to add or take away a flat nine so if you have four or more bits to a chord don't worry too much about the bits at the right hand side because they may change uh, <laughs> without being told that they're going to change because a, an, accomp an accompanist who knows about chords knows that various chords will do the same job and that they're not going to throw you off so an E7 and an E7 flat 9 are not hugely different and for the point of view of a soloist they're pretty well the same um, so the, it just so happens that the B uh, minor 7 flat 5 and the E7 flat 9 can use the same scale um, and fit together really well but as I say the, what's, what's on the left of a chord name is really important and what's on the right is really quite a lot less important so um, looking again at E7 flat 9 the E is vital um, knowing that it's major is very important knowing that it's 7 is pretty important but knowing that it's flat 9 is really not so important at all so let's now look at diminished chords so a C diminished um, is made up of a stack of minor thirds so we start on the C there's a minor third there's a minor third so that's uh, C diminished and it's a symmetrical chord because every interval is the same whereas normally you've got a selection of different intervals so um, uh, D diminished for example would be D minor third minor third minor third and um, diminished are quite difficult to figure out because the fingering is not obvious and you have to basically practice um, diminished scales or diminished arpeggios uh, so you get the fingering right but um, because of the peculiarity of the fact that it re keeps on repeating itself there's a lot fewer diminished chords than um, all the rest because for example C diminished is exact, has exactly the same notes as an E flat diminished has exactly the same notes as a G flat diminished and so on so you only have to learn um, a small number of patterns um, we got a couple more chord types a slash chord is a chord um, it's used a slash chord has a, a root which is not the same as the name of the chord so a C major uh, if you were to take the C um, and put it above instead of below um, so it's now a C with an E on the bottom so it's a C slash E and these kind of chord shapes are used to make a moving bass line and um, so you have a C a, a diagonal slash and then whatever is your root note and the root note, the bottom note is um, not the same as the name of the chord uh, and these again are something that you are that you can pretty well ignore. Uh, this is something for the accompanist. It provides a moving bass line for the accompaniment, but it's not something that's going to affect you. Uh, finally, we've got uh, sus chords or suspended fourth chords, and a C, a C suspended fourth. Um, if we've got C major, basically we're going to take away the third and we're going to put a fourth instead. A suspended chord always leads with the suspended note which is the fourth moving down. So you get something like um, So again this is something that you don't necessarily have to follow if you're just going to play a C through that then that would be fine. So, uh, this is a, um, a lightning whiz through and I'd be very surprised if you understood all of it the first time round. 
but um, if you go through it carefully again and look at the chord symbols um, and then try applying what you've learned to some uh, chord sequences see if you can work out how to play arpeggios for a series of chords now to finish off I'm just going to show you a, a little chord sequence this is the introduction to a tune by Django Reinhardt called Douce Ambiance and it's a very nice series of eight chords uh, seven of which are different um, and I'm going to play first of all the arpeggios to those chords so the chords are D7 E flat major 7 E7 F6 B flat E flat major 7 D7 sus D7 um, so this is actually a really nice chord sequence I'm going to play those arpeggios again with the chords beautiful about this chord sequence is that they're actually designed in such a way that a single melody note runs all the way through them and what this goes to show is that when you're improvising over chords you don't have to always follow the roots of the chords and the arpeggios of the chords quite often there is a single note or a phrase even which will go through several chords which makes them much more interesting so listen again and I'll play D all the through all the way through that. So I hope you found this useful. Uh, if you want to go through this uh, much more slowly, I have two books, um, Beginning Jazz Violin and Exploring Jazz Violin, which both deal in um, much more depth with chords. I also have a, a Music Gurus online video course, um, which again will tell you plenty more about chords and chord sequences. Hope you found this useful and I'll see you again soon.